uh, take your Bible tonight, open to the book of Hebrews, chapter number one. I hope to uh, make this interesting for you, but of course, when you preach on Christ, that's always an interesting topic. And we are in Revelation normally, but I'm going to kind of detour tonight. I want to look in Hebrews chapter 1. And we've been doing a series on Sunday morning called The Characters of Christmas. I want to, I want to do another character here tonight um, along with that series. And Hebrews chapter 1 is uh, where we want to be tonight. I heard of a little boy who was auditioning for a part in a school Christmas play, and he wasn't a very good actor. And after trying out for several parts, the teacher finally decided to give him the part of the narrator in the play. And, and when the boy got home, uh, his mother asked him, uh, hey, did you try out in the play? And she could tell he was very excited. He said, yes, I did. And he said, mom, you know what? I got the most important part in the play. She said, really? She said, uh, did you get the part of Joseph? He said, no. Well, did you get the part of the innkeeper? He said, no. Well, did you become one of the wise men in the play? No. One of the shepherds? No. She said, well, what, what part are you? He said, mom, I'm the voice of God in this play. <laughs> Sometimes when we consider the Christmas story, we forget the most important character in the story, and that, of course, is God the Father. And here what we see in Hebrews chapter 1 is God the Father's commentary on the coming of his Son into the world. Um, this is what God the Father had to say to the world when he brought his Son, Jesus, uh, into this world. And uh, he, as you know, we studied Hebrews before, and I said often that Hebrews was written to Hebrews to tell them to stop being Hebrews, to tell them to, to trust Jesus as Savior and become Christians and go on to Christianity. There were some that the writer was writing to that were looking back into Judaism because they had uh, begun to uh, basically miss some of the some of the rituals and uh, of what they had in their old religion. And, uh, and so the writer of Hebrews is ex exhorting them to move on. Now, there's a big debate about who wrote the book of Hebrews, and uh, some really land on the idea that it was the Apostle Paul. It could have been Paul. It could have been Luke. Some people say it was Paul because of the similar circumstances that are mentioned in the book of Hebrews. For example, in Hebrews 13, 23, Timothy is referenced. So that's Paul's traveling companion and son in the faith. Similar doctrine. Um, you can see some of the same phraseology and Hebrews that you see in Paul's letters, and the use of the Old Testament. Now, whether Paul wrote it or not, we're not, we can't be sure, but I'll tell you one thing. Whoever wrote this, they knew the Old Testament very well. They had a very great knowledge because what we see is that the Old Testament passages that are used so much throughout this whole book of Hebrews. In fact, chapter 1 is really a string of quotations from Old Testament psalms all given by the author, all these string together, and they're talking about the incarnation of Christ and what God the Father said at the coming of Jesus Christ. He kind of just strings these verses together like pearls on a necklace. He places them side by side, and it's a beautiful, beautiful tapestry of Scripture that shows us um, the, uh, about the incarnation of Christ. Really, it's a beautiful example of the unity of Scripture and what we like to call uh, biblical theology. You know, systematic theology is... What does all the Bible say about this one topic or answer this one question? What does the whole Bible say about it? That's what systematic theology does. But biblical theology is, answers this question, what does this one book of the Bible say about this one topic? And really, what the writer of Hebrews is doing in chapter 1 is he's saying, here's what the book of Psalms has to say. All these are messianic Psalms, and this is what they have to say about the coming of Jesus Christ. This is what the Father says about his son's coming. In chapter 1, verse number 5, that's a quote from Psalm 2. In chapter 1, verse 6, that's a quote from Psalm 97. In chapter 1, verse 7, that's a quote from Psalm 104. In chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he quotes from Psalm 45, 6 and 7. In, so, in chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, he quotes from Psalm 102. In verse 13, he quotes from Psalm 110. You understand what I'm talking about there. He's just stringing all these together, and they all support one idea, the coming of Jesus Christ. And beyond that, even more specifically, the idea that the writer is trying to really emphasize is the superiority of Jesus Christ, the supremacy of Christ, the greatness of Christ. And so all these verses really support that one single individual idea. And this is what God the Father said. This is 
uh, him speaking, and it tells us not only what he said, but to whom he said it. So if you're with me, just write down, I want you to see three groups of people, we could say, um, that God was speaking to when he sent his son into the world. First of all, God spoke to the angels. Just write that down. God spoke to the angels. Look at verse number six. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. That's what God said to the angels. Let all the angels worship him. Now, let me just say here that, and I've told you this before when we've studied Hebrews, but that is that one key word that you need to understand in this book is the word better. We see it used over and over again, and what the writer is saying is that what you find in Christ is so much better than what you had before. What you had in Judaism. In Judaism, you had the shadows. In Christ, you have the substance. And so what you have in Christ is just so much better. Uh, does it not irritate you that when you buy something, just a few months later, you see it advertised as something better, new and improved? You know, one of these days, I would like to buy an iPhone where that's the final iPhone. You can't get any better on that. You can't improve it. It's not... It's, it's, it's no higher. I, I have a suspicion if I live to be 80, I'll probably be buying the iPhone 100, you know, at that time. They're always improving. They're always, you know, you buy your kids a, uh, a you know, parents, you know, they, they have these little PlayStation games, you know. You buy them one year, and then the next year, all the games are outdated because now they have a new and improved game. And now you have to buy all that other stuff, right, because it's new and improved. I'd like to buy something or have something where it can never be improved upon, where it is the best that you can have. And this is what the writer here is saying about Jesus. This is what God the Father is saying about his son. And he's saying to the Hebrews, listen, you need to come to Christ because he's so much better than all those things that you prize in Judaism. And when it comes to Christ, there's nothing better. And there's no new and improved. He is supreme. You can't improve upon Christ. You can't improve upon the new covenant that he presents when you come to Jesus Christ. And so over and over again in this letter, you see the writer saying the word better. We have a better things in chapter 6, verse 9. In chapter 7, verse 7, Christ offers a better priesthood than that of the Old Testament. He's a better high priest. In chapter 7, verse 19, Christ gives a better hope. In chapter 7, verse 22, Christ offers a better covenant and, these, and this better covenant is established upon better promises, chapter 8, verse 6. Christ is a better sacrifice, chapter 9, verse 23. We have a better possession through Christ, and that's talking about our possession in heaven. We're looking for a better country. We have a better resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things, you need to understand this, that, that uh, Judaism <clears throat> was fixated on. The Jews had a fixation with angels, that was borderline idolatry. In fact, uh, a Jew in Judaism would say something like this, our religion is great, we have angels. And they held angels in incredibly high esteem. One commentator wrote this, they believed 200 angels controlled the movement of the stars, and that one very special angel, the calendar angel, controlled the never-ending succession of days, months, and years. And there were even some that began to worship angels. But that's nothing new. We have, I know people that do that today. They, they venerate angels. They worship angels. In fact, the Apostle Paul warned the church at Colossae about this heresy of angel worship in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. And did you know that there was a sect of Jews uh, near the Dead Sea that believed in what they called a dual Messiah, both of whom would be subject or under the, under the authority of Michael, the archangel. So this was some bizarre things that was coming out because many people began to embellish the Old Testament teaching about angels. You know, that's what the devil does. He just tries to deceive people. And uh, he uses these tricks to get people's mind off of the Lord Jesus Christ. And w again, we still see that today. People are so fixated, it seems like, on angels and angel worship. And Satan uses this. And Paul warned this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. Let him be accursed, right? And, you know, m many false religions, 
uh, purportedly were started by angels, right? I mean, there's uh, Mormonism, Islam, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah Witnesses were started via angels, and uh, Catholicism seems to really venerate angels and put them up on a pedestal that God never intended. This worship of angels is really kind of a form of Gnosticism because, remember, Gnostics believe that in order to get to the highest God, you had to ascend through a series of beings. In order to ascend through those, a series of beings, you had to know their names. And some Gnosticism was really getting into some of the Jewish um, doctrines And so Jews then began to memorize what they thought were angel names. So for them, it was a form of getting into a superior spiritual position by getting closer to God. And so the writer really debunks all that, the writer of Hebrews, because you know what he does here? He says that, listen, when my son, when Jesus comes into into the world, let all the angels worship him. What is he saying there? That Christ is supreme to any spiritual angel, spiritual being out there. He is superior. In fact, look at verse number four. Being made so much better than the angels, and he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In the Jewish mind, a person's name revealed their essential nature. It also expressed their rank. Now here, he's saying the name of Christ is so much better than any angelic name that you may have. In fact, we don't really know the names of angels. We, we know of uh, uh, several in the Bible, a few in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel and, and Lucifer. And, and beyond that, we don't know of any angelic names. Those names are pretty much forgotten. But the name of Jesus Christ is honored. It is exalted. And this is what the writer is saying. Uh, in verse 5, he quotes from Psalm 27, verse se- or excuse me, verse, uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, I should say, Notice what he says, and, t- and of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits, or excuse me, let me back up here to verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, the argument that he presents here is very simple. God the Father never said to the angels, to any individual angel, you are my son. You are my son. That's that's the argument. The writer is saying, show me an angel where God said to this angel, the way he said to Jesus, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now again, Psalm 2, we preached on that Wednesday night. This is a beautiful messianic psalm. And this was God proclaiming to the world when Jesus came into the world, this is my son. God never said that to any of the other angels. He never said to an angel, you're my son. Now, some people might say, well, now, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say in the Old Testament that the angels are, and the Hebrew expression is, B'nai Elohim, which is the Hebrew sons of God. Doesn't the Bible call the angels in the Old Testament sons of God? Yes, it does. And I don't deny that at all. I, I study that. I see that. But when God refers to these angels as his sons, That is a collectively, God says to these angels, you're my sons. And he's referring to them in that sense because they are the object of his creation. They are created beings. And God says collectively to the angels, you're my sons, plural. But he never spoke specifically to one angel and said, you are my son. That's what he's saying here, that Jesus is the son of God, what about the angels? What is their rank? Well, look, drop down in verses 13 and 14. But to the, which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? What, did God ever say that to an angel? Hey, listen, you sit here until I put all of your enemies under your feet. God said that to his son, Jesus. God never said that to any angel. And God is bringing this world Uh, to that place where he's defeating all the enemies of Christ and he's placing all the enemies under the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. God never said that to any angel. But then look down. Well, what about the angels? What is their role? In verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to, to minister for them who shall be heirs to salvation? Well, what are the role of angels? Well, in God's economy, they are subservient to 
the, those who are heirs of salvation. Now, who is that? That's me. That's you. Did you know that, that we're superior to angels in God's economy in that sense, in God's uh, way of order of things? That the angels, one of their ministries is they are to serve me as a child of God and you. You're an heir of salvation. If you trusted Jesus as your Savior and you know that you're saved, guess what? The angels, part of their purpose in ministry is to serve you, to serve you. They're ministers, ministering spirits sent forth to those who shall be heirs of salvation. You say, well, preacher, do you believe in guardian angels? I do. I believe that angels watch over God's people. I think that's why, uh, you know, I'm probably here tonight, you know. Um, I, I think that God has protected me and he's protected you in ways that we, we won't even know until we get to eternity. You know, I just came from a, a pretty, a pretty uh, challenging area over there in Egypt where it's 95% Muslim and Christians aren't really looked upon that well. And we had to go and meet in churches that were places that were really secret churches. And we have Brother Samuel Thomas, our missionary over there. I believe God's probably constantly watching over him. His house is right across the street from a Muslim mosque, a, a newly built mosque. And you know what he's doing in his house? He's, he started a church that meets in his house right across the street from a Muslim mosque. Think about that. And he's, 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 he's building a work there. He's building a church right there. I think that God protects his people. In fact, I know that because, you know, the Bible gives us a story that illustrates this very principle in Genesis chapter 28. You remember the story of Jacob? He had to leave town fast. Remember, he deceived his father. He stole his brother's blessing. And his mother sends him out to travel to meet her brother, his uncle Laban. And on the way there, he's traveling. And this is a long journey. This is probably the first time he's ever been away from home. And he doesn't reach the city in time to get inside the city gates. The city gates would close right at dusk. So there he is out in the open, and he has to sleep out in the open. You ever, you ever sleep out in the open by yourself in the woods at night? I mean, that's pretty scary. You know, I wouldn't like to do that. But here's Jacob. And he was a mama's boy. You know, he wasn't like Esau. Esau was a hunter. You know, he'd go out hunting. That would be no problem for Esau. But Jacob, he, he helped his mom. He learned how to make a mean bowl of chili uh, in the Old Testament. He won all the chili bake-offs in the Old Testament. And he wasn't used to being outside in the wilderness. But here he was that night. It was dangerous to be out in the open. They had to be worried about robbers and animals. And he was no doubt exhausted from his journey and he fell fast asleep. And you know what happened while he was asleep? He had a dream, the Bible says. And you know what happened in that dream? There was an, a, 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 we, you know, the Bible uses the word ladder. A ladder went from heaven. He sees this, 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 in this dream, this ladder. And all the way at the top of this ladder is God. And the ladder extends all the way down to him. Now, I don't think that ladder is the best translation, the Hebrew word solemn could really mean a staircase or a stairway, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes you see pictures of these ancient pyramids where they have a staircase that goes all the way up to the top, you know. I think this is the idea here. There is a staircase, and it goes all the way up to the top, and at the top there is God the Father. What an incredible dream that was. And you know what he sees? Ascending and descending on the staircase are what? Angels funny because that staircase comes all the way down to where Jacob is, right where he is, and here are the angels ascending and descending on him. And I think that God was saying to Jacob, you know, um, I'm reaching out to you. I mean, that, that ladder, God's grace met Jacob right where he was. It went right down to where he was. And to me, that's a beautiful picture of God's grace. God meets us right where we are. And here are these angels going up and down on this staircase. What does that speak to us about? That is what, really what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He might even have been thinking about that passage in the Old Testament when he wrote this. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. You know what they were doing? They were watching over Jacob that night. What a beautiful picture. Here are these angels serving him. And this is the role of angels. They are servants to us. And so their position is not highly exalted. The angels are all commanded to worship Jesus in verse number 6. And the, the name of Christ is exalted in the Bible. Their names are rarely mentioned 
in the Scripture. And so Jesus has a much more exalted position than any angel. That's why when Jesus was born into the world, what God the Father said is, let all the angels worship him. And you'll notice that in Luke chapter 2, at the birth of Christ, what does the Bible tell us? That there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest. The word multitude, plethos, this is not talking about a handful of angels, not 50 or a or, or 1,500 even, this is talking about a number that no one can mention. It's beyond numbering. It's beyond count. All the angels of God worship Christ. Why? Because he is supreme. He is the supreme Savior. Now, here's the second thing. God spoke to the angels. He said, all, let all the angels work, worship him. But here's number two. God spoke to his son. Look at verse number eight. But unto the son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, here is a, just an, a, a, a wonderful verse. This is one of the great verses in the New Testament. But again, what he's doing here is he's quoting from the Old Testament here in Hebrews 8 and 9. And this verse really is a pillar of our faith the most crucial question for each person to answer correctly is the question that Jesus asked to his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? If we have an inadequate or incorrect view of who Jesus is, we're not going to bow before him. We're not going to worship him. We're not going to call him Savior and Lord. And so really, our eternal destiny rides upon us having a correct understanding of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This is why Satan launches all his attacks against the person of Christ. This is why he's constantly seeking to undermine the doctrine of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why you have people out there like Jehovah Witnesses who try to say, well, he is a God. He's a mighty God, small g, but he's not almighty God. They teach that he was created just like the archangel Michael was created. Even so, Jesus was created, and that through him all other things in the universe were created. So they hold to a relatively high view of Jesus, but they deny the full deity of Jesus Christ. But it's not just the cults and false religions that are questioning the deity of Christ. I'm shocked sometimes to hear what some people that are supposedly called orthodox are saying about it. I'm shocked. And I'm reading things all the time. There was a, a recent book put out called The Myth of God Incarnate. Uh, this is a book that was recognized by church leaders in England. And of course, the title of the book kind of gives the thesis of the book. It's the idea that, that of Jesus, God Incarnate, or God come in the flesh. They say that's a myth. And they go on to say in the book that, you know, you can, you can have Christianity without the doctrine of the Incarnation. That's what they said. Friend, I want to tell you something. If you take the doctrine of the Incarnation out of Christianity, Christianity crumbles like a house of cards. We have no, nothing to worship if Jesus was not God in the flesh. And so there are always these blasphemous attacks against the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's why this verse here is so crucial. It is one of the great Christological passages in the New Testament that claims in clear and unmistakable terms the deity of Jesus Christ. These are the words of God the Father to his Son, and here he's quoting from Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Now, this psalm was originally addressed to a Hebrew king, King David, but it was phrased in a language that could only be fulfilled by the ultimate king, the Son of God. And notice what he says again in verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Here is God the Father, and he's speaking directly to his Son, and what does he say? Thy throne, your throne, O oh God. Here is God the Father saying to God the Son, you are God. You're God, capital G, God. They're both God. Because later in verse 9, the Father refers to himself. Look what he says. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. So there in verse 9, the Father refers to himself as God. So the Father calls his Son God, 
and he first refers to himself as God, and the writer's point is clear. Jesus is God, the eternal king, who will reign forever and ever. He is equal to the Father. He is one with the Father. They are both God there. Such an important verse there in that passage. And there's more I could say about that, but um, we simply believe what the Scripture says, and we hold it by faith that Jesus was truly God and truly man. God and man. Now, again, throughout church history, there have been heresies that have arisen because they don't understand how there could be a union or a uniting between the two na- these two natures, and yet both of these natures are concurrently dwelling in one person without disturbing either or the other. You know, uh, his deity doesn't affect his humanity. His, affani- his humanity doesn't affect his deity. Both of these natures are dwelling concurrently in one person. They're not a mixture. Jesus wasn't a mixture of the divine and the human. That, that teaching there is called monophysite, the monophysite heresy, where they believe, you know, uh, there's a mixture together of these natures, and that forms one. That's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that Jesus was truly God, fully God, and yet he was fully man. Now you say, well, I don't understand that. That's kind of a mystery. Well, that's exactly right. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And like you've heard me say so many times before, theology is not a problem-solving venture. It's a mystery-discerning venture. This is something that's beyond our comprehension, but we receive it, we believe it, because this is what the Bible teaches us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and notice in in verse 10, and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hand. So, here again is just another verse. He's quoting from Psalm 102, verse 25 and 27, to show that Christ is God, but he is the eternal creator, and he created all things. Christ's beginning was not in Bethlehem. He was eternal uh, as, as one preacher said, his beginning was not in maternity, but in eternity. He always was, he was God. So God spoke to the angels. God spoke to his son and said, thou art my son, or thou art, thou art um, God. And then number three, here is the third thing. God spoke to us. God spoke to us. I saved the best for last. We're going to, we kind of backed into this passage tonight, so I want you to back all the way up now to verse 1. And because God spoke to us when he sent Jesus into the world, and what does he say to us? Look at verse number 1. Um, when God sent, he spoke very loudly. Look at verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers man- manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these da- last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but whom also he made the world. God spoke most eloquently when he sent Jesus into the world. Everything that God wanted to say, he said it in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Now, what, he's, what the writer here is referring to is... Uh, The fact that in times past in the Old Testament, when God spoke, he normally spoke through prophets, right? That's how the Old Testament received, um, Old Testament believers received the word of God. It was through prophets, and he did it in verse 1, in sundry times, that is at different times, and in divers manners, in different ways, God spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And the writer is saying, look, God spoke to the patriarchs through prophets. God spoke to the kings in the Old Testament through prophets. He spoke to all of our ancestors and forefathers through prophets. He would use visions. He would use dreams. He would use words. He would use uh, written revelation. And each of these Old Testament prophets, they all had a part of revealed truth. They had a part of the truth. But now God God spoke through his Son. And his son is the full manifestation of truth. Now, I normally like to use an analogy to illustrate this. And I use the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you ever have one of those jigsaw puzzles that has like a thousand pieces? 
and I always make this request because it, it doesn't matter. I can make this request. I still always get one every year. Please do not buy me a jigsaw puzzle as a present. Those things drive me nuts. I, I, you know, but nevertheless, I'm going to get one this year. Uh, the, the last time I, I, I made this request, someone sent me a jigsaw puzzle of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, thank you. As if I have time to do that. I can't even figure out the Dead Sea Scrolls when they're in front of me in a full picture. I read about a man by the name of Eric Smith, 73 years old. He took a jigsaw puzzle that had 24,000 pieces to it, and he put it together. Now, obviously, he was retired and had a lot of time on his hands. 24,000 pieces. He worked every day. It took him six months to complete that jigsaw puzzle. All 24,000 pieces were all in place. But you know what? When I think of that, I think of the Old Testament because if you go back to the Old Testament, all these prophets that lived in all these different eras and times, and God revealed pieces of the truth to them. He would give them a vision or a dream and, uh, or a prophecy, and they all had a part of the truth. They had a piece of the puzzle, but none of those prophets had the full picture of the puzzle. You see, you know, that the Old Testament has roughly about 25,000 verses in it. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when he came into this world, there's a sense in which Jesus put all those pieces together when he came to this earth. Jesus is the full revelation of all those pieces that the prophets had in the Old Testament. You know, um, know, when you you see that jigsaw puzzle, when someone gives it to you, and it's in a box, right? And what's on the top of the box? It's the picture, right? This is what it's supposed to look like when you put all the pieces together, you know. Of course, mine never, ever looks like that. But if you put all the pieces together, here's what the picture looks like. And inside the box are all those small pieces. Now, beloved, the Old Testament is the box that has all the pieces of truth, but Jesus Christ is the front of the box. He gives us the full revelation. He is the full picture of divine truth. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is reminding the Jews who gloried in the prophets. Hey, we had the prophets that preached and gave us truth. Yeah, they each gave a piece of the truth, but Jesus is now the full revelation of that truth. And now God in these last days has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the truth of God. Now, you say, well, what does the picture on the box look like for Jesus Christ? Well, the writer kind of gives us some indicators here. First of all, Jesus is the inheritor. In verse number two, it says that uh, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, Uh, It is the nature for sons to inherit all of what the Father has. Everything the Father has has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the heir of all things. He has all things because God the Father has put all things into his possession and under his authority. Again, Psalm 2, God the Father said to the Son, Ask of me and I I will make the nations your inheritance. You know what God the Father is doing? He's bringing all the world into under the submission of Jesus Christ. He is is heir of all things, but also he's a creator. Look again in verse number um, two where it says, by whom also he created the worlds. The the word for worlds here, aeonus, literally ages. One scholar says the sum of the periods of time, including all that is manifested in and through them. Jesus was the agent in whom the entire universe of space and time exists. I mean, everything is sustained because of Jesus Christ. Again, that's just an incredible thought, that the baby in the manger was upholding all things by the word of his power. And then also, he is the glory of God. Look what it says in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory. Not only is he the inheritor of all things, the creator and upholding all things, he is the glory of God, who being in the brightness of his glory, Now, in the Old Testament, when God would reveal himself in some glorious light, they called that the Shekinah glory. 
And you've heard me say before that in Ezekiel, there's a picture of God's glory coming out off the temple, going down through the, uh, the, uh, out the eastern gate, down through the Valley of Kidron, up to the Mount of Olives, and then it ascends up and it goes away, and we don't see it again. And you don't see it again until in the New Testament, when Jesus comes back to the temple, remember he presents himself as the son of David there on Palm Sunday. You remember the route he took? He started at the top of the Mount of Olives, came down through the Valley of Kidron, went in through the eastern gate, and went into the temple. He took the route in that the glory of God took out in the Old Testament. And, and in, in a sense, what Jesus was saying is that he was the glory of God returning to the temple. Jesus is the manifestation of God's glory. And we see in the Gospels on the Mount of Transfiguration where all the glory inside of Christ uh, began to radiate outwardly to remind us that Jesus is the glory of God, who he is, the brightness of God's glory. But also it says here that he's the express image of his person. Express image is the Greek word uh, character, where, where obviously where we get our word character. And it was a word used to speak of the image or imprint on a coin that leaves an exact image, the corresponding image. Jesus is the exact character or image of God the Father. That's why Jesus could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father, because he is the express image of God. He's, he's very God of very God. But then he's also in, uh, in verse 3, um, where he's up, upholding all things by the word of his power, we talked about him, him, be, him being the sustainer, upholding all things. And then also it tells us that he's the Savior in verse 3 where it says that when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It was Jesus who paid for our sins. And when he went to heaven, uh, he sat down on the, on the right hand of the majesty on high. High. Um, on the cross, Jesus paid our sin debt. He satisfied the wrath of the Father. You know, I, I, get, I get so weary of hearing about, you know, some of these the, uh, teachers that say, you know, after Jesus died on the cross, you know, he took his blood up to heaven and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat there is in heaven. And they kind of they just embellish this teaching that's not in the Bible anywhere. On the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it. Everything that needed to happen in order for our sins to be, fa to be paid for took place right there on the cross. And when Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. And friends, when Jesus went to heaven, he didn't go there to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. When Jesus went to heaven, he sat down on the right hand of God the Father because it was all done. And now he was exalted. He paid the price for our sin. When it, he's ruler because it says he sat down on the right hand of of the majesty on high. God the Father now exalts him, not only, not only as redeemer, but ruler, because all sacrifice for sin was finished. And, and so this is, the, this is what the picture looks like. And this is what God the Father is saying to us about Christmas. This is what he wants us to know about his son. God spoke to the angels. He said, all the, let all the angels worship him. God spoke... Uh, to us, and he, uh, he said, you know, this is my son, and I'm speaking through him now. This is who he is. God spoke in a very profound way through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God spoke to the angels. God spoke to his son. You are my son. You're God. And he spoke to us. And this is God on Christmas. This is what he had to say. This is his commentary for all the world. And again, the question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, what are we, you know, where are we in our relationship? What do you think of Christ? Who is he to you? You can't be neutral about him. Either you truly believe who he is or you don't. And friend, if you trust what the Scripture says, that he's God of very gods, the Savior of the world, then the only proper response is to bow before him is to repent of your sin, is to call him Lord and be his servant. Humbly repent and put all of your faith in what Christ has done for you. Let's bow for prayer tonight. Shall we bow for prayer together? <clears throat> and I want you again, for, beloved, just examine your heart. If you say, I know that I'm saved and I praise God for it, then take a moment and would you just...
praise God the Father and thank him for what he said to us in giving us Jesus, for how he spoke at that first Christmas. And he's still speaking today. He's speaking to whoever will listen. Father, thank you again for what you're doing in hearts and lives. And I pray, Lord, again tonight, if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ, that they would just reach out in true faith, that they would truly repent and turn to him with all their heart, receive Christ, and receive forgiveness of sin and new life. And may we, Lord, worship Christ all of our days, love him all the more. Again, Lord, let us not be distracted in this time, but keep our, our, our mind, our heart, our focus, like the writer of Hebrews will tell us in another place, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, let that be our mindset. And we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.